जयदेव गल्ला जी बाद आपने समेत थैंक यू सर सर आई मेड माय मेड इन स्पीच इन 2014 व्हेन आई एंटर्ड दिस हाउस ऑन द स्पीच ऑन द प्रेसिडेंट्स एड्रेस एंड नाउ सिंस आई हैव डिक्लेयर्ड दैट आई एम नॉट कंटेस्टिंग इन दिस कमिंग जनरल इलेक्शन दिस विल बी माय फाइनल स्पीच इन दिस हाउस फॉर नाउ सर सर आई कम फ्रॉम अ फैमिली ऑफ फ्रीडम फाइटर्स my grandfather sri patu rajgopal naidu was a freedom fighter social worker reformer writer right hand of legendary parliamentarian professor ng ranga and was also mla mlc and twice member of this very house sir my mother was a fourth term mla and a minister in the government of andhra pradesh so i come from a family sir which has a legacy of fighting for the people This is indeed the last session of the Lok 17th Lok Sabha and every member of the house is bidding adieu. And the reason that I've decided to not contest also is that it's not easy sir to sail on two boats in one go to be in public life and also to continue as an entrepreneur. So I've decided to give a pause to my political life. Despite stepping aside from electoral politics, my commitment and resolve to serve the nation remain steadfast as i plan to contribute to the country's development by investing innovating creating employment opportunities and generating revenue and wealth for the nation sir my group of companies is providing jobs to about 17000 people and undertaking various welfare measures for them and their family members so i serve the country in a different form sir and i'm sure this house and the people of my state will appreciate my decision Before I start my observations on the president's address, I would like to take the opportunity to first thank our party president Sri Narayana Chandrababu Naidu Garu, who has allowed me to be part of this house twice, and I admit that I have learned a lot from him, and he has guided me during my tenure and difficult times. I also would like to thank the honourable speaker and all the chairmen for their help, cooperation, and guidance in this house. I also express my gratitude to the officials of the Lok Sabha Secretariat, who are always ready. to help the members i particularly thank and wish to place on record my admiration for the reporters sitting at the table who record and report our speeches verbatim when i read my speech the next day i could not stop appreciating the flawless speech that has reached me so i also thank them sir and more than anybody else i sincerely and wholeheartedly express my deep sense of gratitude to every single team member of my guntur parliamentary constituency the tdp leaders and the colleagues of guntur without whose support cooperation and blessings i would not have been able to undertake my 10 year successful journey as an mp and would not have done whatever i could for the people of guntur so i once again thank all of them from the bottom of my heart sir i compliment the honorable prime minister sri modi ji for finally consecrating the ram mandir temple in ayodhya and the entire country is greatly indebted to him i plan to visit the temple one day as it realizes the 500 year old dream of all hindus the world knows that we are one of the oldest civilizations on earth here i only wish to say that the stones may be old but they are chiseled afresh our civilization may be ancient but i feel it is born again the last 10 years of modi ji's government may be like any other but he ensured that it marks a new dawn the date of 22nd january in many ways has redefined and rediscovered our civilization not just this this new parliament imbued with the fragrance of ek bharat shreshtha bharat is one more testimony to our great civilization and culture sir i compliment the honorable prime minister for his leadership and vision for the country sir even though we are not a part of the nda i cannot resist my temptation to praise the government under the stewardship of sri modi ji over the last 10 years how he has taken this country to new heights and we are on the verge of becoming the third largest economy in the world it is not just governance but is the leadership that counts and modi's leadership modi ji's leadership sir i just want to mention the top 10 things achievements of this government which has really brought me a lot of uh, joy sir first he has made our country the fastest growing among economy among the g20 countries 25 crore people have been lifted out of poverty and are being 80% are being given free food grains until 2028 the credit for rolling out the gst goes to modi ji forex reserves are registering 615 billion dollars now 
the push to digital India. 46% of the world's total real-time digital transactions take place in India. 1,200 crore transactions were done through the UPI in December 23. Now even Eiffel Tower tickets can be purchased through the IPI. Number five, 34 lakh crore has been transferred through the DBT and JAM Trinity and has helped to curb corruption. Number six, 3.75 lakh roads have been constructed in villages, 1.46 lakh national highways, and 150 airports, sir. Number seven, one nation, one power grid, one nation, one gas grid, one nation, one ration card, one rank, one pension have all been welcomed, sir. Number eight, successfully dealing with the COVID pandemic and free vaccines to more than 150 countries. Number nine, 33% 33 reservation, 33 reservation for women, women as fighter pilots for the first time, women cadets given admission for the first time in Sinic schools and the National Defense Academy. And finally, number my top 10, the 10, sir, rounding out the top 10, the PM Kisan and the PM Fasal Bima Yojana have been a great boon for the farmers of this country. Sir, you must be aware, the House is aware, that I've spoken on various subjects relating to local, state, national, and even international issues during my 10 years in this House, and, he, and gave valuable suggestions and recommendations, including in the committees that I participated in, some of which have been accepted and have been implemented as policy also. So I would like to thank Modi ji and this government for the same. With your permission, I would like to ch touch upon a few things which I have been able to achieve for the people of Guntur, sir. Sir, number one, I fought for the capital Amaravati, raised it many times in Parliament, and I'm still supporting the farmers' agitation, which is going on for more than 1,500 days for making Amaravati as a sole capital. It's still happening, sir, in my constituency. Sir, sir, just a, a few more minutes, sir. I'm, this is my final speech. Please it's indulge me speech, and give me a couple of minutes. Sir, number two, I could get 1,500 crores for the development of Amaravati and 1,000 crores for my constituency in Guntur for the underground drainage system from the central government. Nearly 20,000 houses have been sanctioned in the Guntur Lok Sabha area. 50,000 free water connections to the poor have commenced. I've been instrumental in getting chili and turmeric better remunerative price and also geotagging of chilies for export. Succeeded in getting exemption on tax on capital gains on the first sale of land for farmers from 29 villages of Amaravati. The Kondaviti Vagu lift irrigation project was completed. Many lift irrigation projects were completed in the constituency, sir. Ames in Mangalgiri, CHC in Tullur, and PHCs in Chebrolu, Chebrolu Dugrala, Vattichirukuru, and Medikonduru have been completed, sir. I played a crucial role in announcing Amravati as a smart city. Development of Guntur road infrastructure, including the inner ring road, various railway works under progress, one KV Kendra Vidyalaya at Tenali in my tenure, National Agriculture University for Guntur, 60 crores worth of development undertaken in 10 years with MP LAD and Mandrega funds, and the list goes on, sir. Sir, the Honorable President has rightly mentioned about setting up of a central tribal university in Telangana. I welcome it. But at the same time, I ask the Honorable Prime Minister as to what his government has done about various institutions mandated to be set up in the state of Andhra Pradesh under the AP Reorganization Act. As per the 13th schedule of this act, the government of India should set up 11 institutions right from tribal university to National Institute of Disaster Management. Sir, the less I talk about Polavaram, the better. When TDP left the government in 2019, about 75% of the project was completed. But now, even after five years, it appears the project is exactly where it was five years ago. Since this is my final speech, I appeal to the Honorable Prime Minister to approve the second revised cost estimate of the project which comes to 55,656 crores and complete the project in a time-bound manner. Sir, again, I don't want to enter into a debate on special category status to AP. It was Modi ji and former Vice President Shri Venkai Naidugaru who promised SCS for 10 years to the state. Nothing happened and the government of India is trying to escape by showing non-existing 14th Finance Commission recommendations. All I ask the Honorable Prime Minister is to either give special category status to AP, or extend all facilities, financial and otherwise, that are being extended to the northeastern and the hilly states, also to AP, as a stopgap arrangement till SCS is confirmed for a period of 10 years, sir. So there are other issues, such as setting up of major port, integrated steel plant, crude oil refinery, and petrochemical complex, establishing a new railway zone in Vishakhapatnam, 
development of a metro rail facility in Vishakhapatnam, and connecting Vijaywada, Guntur, Tenali, uh, among other things. The railway minister is on record saying that the government of AP has not given land for a new railway zone, but government of AP has says it has given land. So who to believe, sir? We need a clarification. Sir, since I'm not speaking on the budget, I wish to just touch upon a couple of points on the Indian economy. Sir, by moving from the 10th largest economy 10 years ago to the 5th largest is an indisputable fact that we are the, one of the biggest bright spots in the world's economy today. Modi ji rightly says that we have immense potential, backed by impressive performance during the last decade, as we could demonstrate and showcase robust and resilient growth driven by perseverance, ingenuity, and vision. I wish that Bharat continues this in the coming years and becomes the third largest in the next two to three years' time. We should all agree that reforms help us to be the fastest growing economy among G20 countries. The growth this fiscal is estimated to be about 7.5% when compared to 9.1% in 21-22 and 7.2% in 22-23. Forex reserves are over 615 billion US dollars. FDI is impressive. Foreign trade is going up. 25 crores came out of poverty. Unprecedented creation of infrastructure with 23.5 lakh crore tax receipts and 30.3 lakh crore revenue receipts are very healthy and less anticipation of borrowings are there in the coming fiscal. I am sure that Bharat is poised to achieve these set goals in Amrit Kal and the list goes on. But at the same time, we should admit that we are not able to provide jobs that people are expecting. We are still making the industry run from pillar to post for approvals and permissions, particularly in sectors like EV and lithium-ion battery manufacturing, among others, and imposing duties on them despite claiming that Government of India is facilitating ease of doing business. I appeal to the Honorable Prime Minister to focus a little bit more on this, sir. Otherwise, it's not easy to achieve the objectives of behind Atma Nirbhar Bharat. There are some challenges that our economy is facing, such as increasing integration of the global economy, and to be in tune with that, we have to push our domestic performance and also be ready to bear the spillover effects of the global economy. Secondly, artificial intelligence and the challenges it poses to governments, given apprehensions that AI may eat away jobs, particularly in the services sector. Thirdly, non-availability of talented and skilled workforce in the industry. I am sure the government is looking into these and other issues to further propel the growth to become the third largest economy, sir. Sir, we are in the election year, and a couple of months from now, we are going to have general elections and also assembly elections in my state, sir. For free and fair elections, the Election Commission should ensure error-free electoral rolls. But if you look at AP, the ground reality is the other way around. The DEOs and EROs are not following the directives of the ECI in preparing error-free electoral rolls due to pulls and pressures from the ruling dispensation. The delegation of TDP met the full ECI and letter was also written by former CMC Nara Chandrabhav Naidgaru about the subjugation of the democratic rights of the people of AP through electoral malpractices and of removing names of TDP supporters and sympathizers from the electoral <laughs> list. So there is a need to immediately deploy electoral, electoral role observers in AP from Government of India to stop these electoral malpractices. The unfortunate part is that the field machinery deployed, instead of correcting mistakes in the electoral roles, which is the crux of the issue, took a casual approach by transferring the responsibility to lower officers and not following strict and meticulous instructions given by the ECI. And they conclude. Sir, I'm just coming to the conclusion, sir. Sir, I'm coming to the conclusion. I'm, as I said, sir, I'm taking a break from politics. And the reason is I cannot sail on two boats at the same time due to various limitations. I feel that businessmen are a very important part of the political process, which is essential in my opinion, as they play a pivotal role in driving the economy and its growth. They need to have freedom to express themselves and to take a stand against the government of the day when necessary without fear of reprisals and attacks on their business. The institution should ensure, this institution, the parliament sure, should ensure that law-abiding businesses are not exposed to harassment even if they don't share the same political views. This is extremely important, sir, because if we look at the, the affidavits uh, submitted by all the members, 20% of this Lok Sabha are declared as businessmen. I'm sure all of them are having the same problems that I faced in this last 10 years. In the developed world, business people are encouraged to be part of the political administration as they can play an important part in helping people take charge of their economic destinies. Unfortunately, in our country, this means constant fear of reprisals and vendettas. To start and run a business, one has to get 
more than 70 approvals from various agencies at the local, state, and central level. And each of these agencies can be weaponized by the party in power, which is detrimental to the Make in India initiative, Atmanirbar Abhiyan, and defeats the very objective of ease of doing business. While I may be stepping away from politics, I will not be sleeping, sir. I will continue to contribute to my state and to the country as a businessman by investing, innovating, and creating employment opportunities, revenue, and wealth for the nation. When I can devote my full time to politics and be the type of representative that I want to be and that the people deserve, just like Sridham, Sridham's return after his 14 years of Vanavas, I will also come back stronger, sir. With these words, I support the motion and thank the Honorable President for her address to both the houses. Thank you for giving me the Thank time. you very much. Thank you.